Hello everyone, today we'll be solving a leak code problem in four programming languages. In addition to that, we'll be using various combinations of two programming paradigms common in distributed computing, using a GPU to perform some calculations and MPI to distribute our calculation across multiple processes and potentially on multiple machines. We'll be looking at this leak code problem, which is to determine if a 9x9 Sudoku board is valid but not necessarily solvable. Each row, column, and subbox of the grid must have the digits 1 through 9. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be solvable, just valid as it is. Let's jump right into our BQN solution first. So this is what our Sudoku boards will look like. And here's our full solution. This solution will be the basis for all of our later solutions as well. We'll walk through this line by line. The first line is a utility function to filter out any zeros that we might have. And here we have another utility function to return an integer indicating whether any duplicates were found in any sublists. Next, we check for duplicates in all the filtered rows and columns and assign these to variables. These ranges that I'm using are used to create indices for grouping the values in X. I'll show a trimmed down version of their output to give you an idea. Next, I do something similar to get the indices for the boxes. This creates indices for the first three boxes, and you can probably imagine how to extend this to get the indices for the other boxes. I just add three to the previous indices, and then I add six. And here we have all three layers of indices stacked on top of each other. Using these indices, I group all the elements of the input and then check all of them for duplicates. And then in the end, I check if there were duplicates in the blocks or in the rows or in the columns, and then I use that to index into our strings to indicate whether our Sudoku board is valid or not. And then this is our full solution once more. Here we run it on a good Sudoku board and a bad Sudoku board, and we get the output we expected. Now that we've finished our BQN solution, before we move on to the Python solution, I'd like to talk about our approach to this for the rest of the procedural languages, because they will all be pretty similar. Just like in the BQN solution, we have three collections which represent the validity of the rows, and another for the columns, and a third for the blocks. And here I have a subset of a Sudoku board on the bottom. In our procedural languages, we'll create an array thrice the size of the grid to hold these values. Note that this is not as space or time efficient as many of the solutions that you can find on the discussion page for the leak code problem, but it's much easier to parallelize, and that's really the point of this video. Let's now walk through a few steps of our algorithm, starting at the second row and the first column of our Sudoku board, which relates to the second row of our row matrix. And because we're looking at our row matrix, we'll take the row index in our Sudoku board as the row for our row matrix, and we'll take the value in the cell, in this case six, as the column in our row matrix. We'll increment the value at this location in our row matrix, or in the first layer of our 3D sum matrix that we'll use to get our final answer. Let's move on to check on the first row and the second column of our Sudoku board for our column matrix. Because we're looking at our column matrix, or the second layer of our final sum array, we'll use the column index as the row of our column matrix, and the value in that cell for the column index in our column matrix. You can see the value in our Sudoku board is 3, so we are looking at the third column in our column matrix. We'll increment the value at this location in our column matrix, or the second layer of our 3D sum matrix that we we'll use to get our final answer. Finally, let's look at the first block in our Sudoku board, which corresponds to the first row in our block matrix, and let's look at the first cell in that block. The value in the first cell in the first block is 8, so we'll increment the first row and 8th column in our block matrix. And then same for the second element in the first block, which is 3, so we increment the third column in the first row of our block matrix. Zeros represent nothing being filled in in that cell in the Sudoku board, so we can just skip the zeros. If we then perform these three operations for every cell in the Sudoku board, we'll have a final matrix that indicates all the row, column, block, value combinations that we have. And if any cell in that final matrix has a value greater than 1, like this here, then our board is invalid. If we were then to check the final cell in the first block of our board, we would find that the eighth element of the first row of our block matrix would be incremented again, which would mean we have an invalid board. If any value in our final sum array is greater than 1, then we know that we have at least one duplicate in at least one row, column, or block. What's neat about this solution is that no single operation depends on any other operation. This way, our work can be performed on multiple machines or different devices. As long as we synchronize at the end, our solution will be the same. Now that we've talked strategy, let's see what this looks like in our Python solution. 
Here's our simple serial Python solution. You can see on this line that we increment the value in the first layer of our full 3D matrix according to the row and the value in the cell currently being examined. And then we do the same for our column matrix. And finally, the same for our block matrix. It just takes a little bit of math to figure out what our block index is. And then here's our full solution once more. I use this main function to run the Python solution on four boards, two valid and two invalid. And we see that we get the output that we expect. Now we'll look at another Python example, but this time one that uses MPI to distribute the calculations. MPI provides a lot of infrastructure for distributed computing. Using the MPI run command spawns n processes, each of which knows how many other processes were spawned, what its unique process ID is, and some other relevant information. These processes may be spawned on multiple machines even, and MPI gives us the tools to communicate between these processes. We'll take advantage of this infrastructure to perform our calculations on multiple processes. Here's our MPI distributed solution in Python. And this is what the setup looks like to get an MPI program running. You can see that we only pay attention to the return value if we are on rank zero. You can think of the rank sort of like a thread ID. Here we chunk up our work based on how many processes we have. Say we're given five processes and we have 81 cells to check because that's the size of our Sudoku board. The calculation looks something like this. Chunk is then the smallest amount of work for each process such that all the work that needs to be done is performed. This is a common calculation that needs to be done in parallel computing. And note that our final process may exit early if the work is not evenly divisible by the chunk size. We then generate all the possible combinations of rows and columns and iterate over only the elements that fall within the chunk of work that belongs to our current MPI process. The rest of this code is exactly the same as our serial implementation, so I won't spend too much time on it. This next bit is a bit more interesting, though. We create a global array with the size we need to hold our final sum matrix, and we use the MPI function reduce. This function will perform the operation op, in this case MPI sum, to join the arrays R and global R together on rank zero specified by the root argument. This means that our final summed matrix for all components of the solution is on the MPI process with rank zero. We can then check to see if we have any cells with values greater than one and return that value if we're on rank zero. Otherwise, we can just return false since no other rank has the full array. And once again, this is the full Python solution with MPI. Here I run the example on five processes and we see that we get the same solution as with our serial example. Now that we've covered Python and Python plus MPI, let's take a look at our C++ solutions. We'll start with just a serial solution. All of our C++ solutions will use a board that looks like this. And here's our serial C++ solution. You can see pretty much everything about our solution is the same so far. You might notice the IDX2 and IDX3 functions. These just calculate the linear index from subscripts like X and Y or rows and columns. So we can feel like we're using 2D and 3D subscripts while keeping our arrays totally linear. Here's our IDX2 function, for example. I'll be using these functions for the rest of my solutions since they make the code much more readable. Here at the end, I find the max value again and check to make sure it's less than two. Running our executable gives us the same answers as our previous implementations. Now that we've looked at a serial implementation in C++, let's look at an MPI distributed implementation in C++. Here it is. It's a little bit more noisy, so we'll again walk through it in a few different steps. All the setup is the same between the last several solutions. Astute viewers may recognize that this is a Cartesian product, but I couldn't find a nice way to do this with the STL algorithms. If any viewers know of a nicer way to generate the Cartesian product of two containers, please let me know. The core loop is much the same as our other solutions, aside from unpacking the row and column as a tuple. And then this section below is exactly equivalent to the last part of our Python version. This should give you an idea of what it's like to use the raw C and Fortran interfaces to MPI. And here's the Python solution below. You can see how similar they look. In my main function, I iterate over the same boards and use some extra logic so we only see the results that rank zero gave back. Running the solution works just as all our previous solutions did. 
Now that we've looked at an MPI distributed example in C++, we'll take a look at a CUDA enabled solution. Here's our single process CUDA implementation. I for the most part am using raw CUDA, but I use a few helper methods from Thrust as well, such as the TypeSafe device malloc and free and some pointer casting methods. For those that are unfamiliar, the funny looking function calls with the triple braces are how you launch a raw CUDA kernel. These allow you to pass arguments to the CUDA runtime to let it know how you'd like your CUDA kernel to be launched. I'm also using the following using statements to make the code a little more readable. Along with the previous code that should look pretty familiar at this point, I defined two other CUDA kernels. The first is this short setRC kernel, which sets rows and columns based on the kernel launch parameters. This is a shortcut for the Cartesian product of the rows and columns that runs on the GPU. The other kernel is this setR function, which is the same core kernel that's been at the heart of all of our solutions so far. The atomic add function is from the CUDA runtime, which allows us to atomically add values to our final array from multiple CUDA threads. Outside of those two kernels, the solution should look pretty familiar at this point. We allocate our final array and pass it to our CUDA kernel along with the Sudoku board after copying it to the GPU. We then synchronize with our GPU to make sure the kernel finishes before reducing to find the maximum value with thrust reduce, freeing our memory and returning whether all values fell below two. Now that we've covered a CUDA and a distributed version of our C++ solution, let's look at both. This will probably be our most complicated solution and it will be MPI distributed and CUDA enabled. Now that we're using two extra paradigms, CUDA GPU device offloading and MPI distributed computing, our code is looking more noisy. It's still pretty much the same solution as our non-distributed CUDA solution though. The set R kernel is a little bit different from our non-distributed CUDA solution since we're only operating on a subset of our Sudoku board. We set the values in our final sum matrix for the row, column, and block submatrices just like before. This time, however, we're given this offset parameter. This is because we're not just running CUDA kernels, we're running CUDA kernels on multiple processes and potentially multiple separate machines, so we're only performing a subset of the full set of operations. This offset parameter tells us where we should start relative to the entire set of operations. We're also not using the built-in thread index.y since we're launching our CUDA kernel in a 1D grid with pre-calculated row and column indices instead of a 2D grid. If we return to the start of our top level function, you'll see that we calculate the work that should be performed on this MPI process. We also set up our row and column indices using our Cartesian product kernel. We then set up our final sum matrix on the device, and then we launch our core kernel to perform the operations assigned to the current rank. We then synchronize with our GPU device and copy the data to a host vector before reducing the final sum array across all of our ranks using MPI. Note that if we used a GPU-enabled MPI provider, we could send the data on the device directly to another system's GPU without copying the memory to the host, but this does have other complications, so I kept it simple for this example. And then we perform our final reduction on a root rank to see if we have any cells with values greater than one. We could perform this reduction on the device, but it's probably not worth it to copy the data back to the device for just one operation. And there we have it, our Sudoku board validator is now running on multiple processes using multiple GPUs, potentially on multiple separate machines. Now that we've covered all of our C++ solutions, let's move on to Fortran. You're likely not surprised that this looks pretty familiar. In my opinion, if we clear away some of the declarations and initializations, this looks fairly readable. You might notice that I have to repeat myself a couple times because there's not really a nice way to increment a value in Fortran. Now we can move on to the MPI distributed Fortran implementation. This solution is pretty long, so I'll break the function into a few slides and look at it kind of like a sliding window. Here's the top of the solution. This is mostly declarations and initializations again, so it's not very exciting. You'll notice here that I create row and column arrays again because this makes distributing the processes much simpler. The core loop is the same as the other distributed solutions. I only work on the rows and columns assigned to the current rank. We then reduce the solution across all of our ranks to get the full array on rank zero. We then perform our max reduce to get our answer and then we return. Okay, now that we've looked at our MPI enabled Fortran implementation, We've looked at all of the different languages with all the different paradigms. I hope you all have enjoyed this video and I hope to see you next time.